This is Kimberly Quinn, host of the Minecraft podcast, and I can't tell you how much fun I have had doing this podcast. I, I started when the world closed over the pandemic in, a, in an attempt to spread some positivity out there and give people some strategies to enhance their own well-being and reduce anxiety and all that. Now, two years later, we're still going strong and now listened to by 52 countries across the world. And I've even helped some of my students get going with their own podcasts. It's super easy to do. And I'll tell you, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it is the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. I'll just explain for you. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It is a ball. Start today. Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another Minecraft discussion. Uh, remember, this is all be about becoming the boss of your brain and living your best life. This is Kimberly Quinn, and I'm looking. I'm looking forward. I'm not looking forward to because I'm in it right this minute. Um, to have this discussion about creating a personal nook or niche of your own, and uh, this is not about having, you know, a, a ton of space because we can create a little nook of our own without that. We're going to get that. Get to that in a few moments. So my inspiration from today is coming from Sarah Bon Brednick from her Simple Abundance book, which as, as I mentioned in previous episodes, I now at a fabulous 57, I look back, I, I think it's probably, I was reading it, I think in my thirties, mostly, you know, I was at home with the kids and everything. It just, these, these little daily things really gave me, gave me a lift. And so they also go by month. I'm looking in June and she starts off with in solitude, we give passionate attention to our lives, to our memories, to the details around us. And Virgin Virginia Woolf said this. I'll just say it one more time. Virginia Woolf says, in solitude, we give passionate attention to our lives, to our memories, to the details around us. And I'm also going to say something, too, because especially as a card-carrying extrovert, that people often think we don't need time to ourselves, that that's an introverted thing. Well, the thing is, everybody need time, needs time to themselves. We need, we need balance, whatever that means for you. So obviously, extroverts may, may need less time for ourselves because we get fueled by people, but it doesn't mean we don't need any. And introverts certainly need some socializing, though just not to the degree that extroverts do. And obviously, since life, life happens on a spectrum, we can be anywhere between those two labels or boxes. And, you know, everybody needs, no matter what your wiring is, needs some, you know, space to call their own, even married people of 30 whatever years. And my husband and I are in a good rhythm with this because, you know, sometimes I'll have an afternoon here where I'm remote and he gets a lot less of that, quite honestly. Though, thankfully, at our respective ages, we have um, a house that's got some space. We've got an upstairs and a downstairs. So even if we don't have the house to ourselves for a few hours a week, Somebody can be up and somebody can be down. I prefer up and he prefers his his sort of man cave down there. So it really works. And, and that's with space. We're going to get to it, though, shortly that you don't have to have that kind of space, which we did not always have, actually. So Sarah continues. She says, in October 1928, the British novelist and literary critic Virginia Woolf gave two lectures on women in fiction at Cambridge University in England. In her talk, she publicly voiced for the first time what women had quietly shared among themselves for centuries. In order for women to create, they needed privacy, peace, personal incomes, sorry, and personal incomes. The following year, these lectures were published as A Room of One's Own, which was Wolf's recommendation if women were to honor and own their, hone their creativity and not become crazed with the torture of silence. Wow. And so I uh, just mentioned that uh, Sarah's book is really geared towards women, though obviously um, if you're, you know, male, female, or anywhere in between, this is true for all of us, for sure, that we need to have a space of our own and to definitely to, to create, but just to exist and have some silence, some solitude, and also to have just a spot of your own where you put your stuff 
and uh, just so important. And I know for me as a, as a definitely um, a creative, I definitely think of myself as a creative. Um, this is very difficult to do as much as I love people. Cause I'm explosively extroverted. I love people. I don't like my, and I also love my office. My, I, my office is in this high traffic area. It's got great lighting, exposed brick, and happy things all over the walls. And it's, it's just attracts students and it's, it's just very, very inviting. And still that's where I do all of my, you know, um, you know, uh, social, I don't mean just socializing, but professional socializing with students and, you know, listening to all their cares and concerns and things that they share with me also with colleagues. And that's where all that kind of tra- trafficy transactional stuff goes. Um, but in order to create, to create these videos and podcasts, as well as the workshops that I do and the presentations that I give at, you know, colleges and universities and such, I've got to be here or maybe not here. I've done, actually, I did some of them last summer in Madrid and Nice and, you know, wherever I was, I can do them wherever. The point is I've got to sneak off. I've got to sneak off to the beach or to the woods or even some quiet little corner of a city, actually, which sounds like a, an oxymoron, but they do exist. In fact, I did a couple last year from a hotel lobby, and I I asked the one of the uh, the people there, the hotel workers, if they wouldn't mind. You know, the breakfast was over, so they had that all kind of closed off. And I said, "Do you mind if I just sneak in here? I promise I won't touch anything." And they said, "Sure, go ahead." But the point is that I, I I've got to, you know, I've got to have that 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 quiet spot to be able to actually create film or do the audio or even just to just to think and definitely for the workshops some of my best ideas have come out in the woods and I think that I mentioned Minecraft itself the title for it came with uh, on a walk with Giovanni and I was just about to get in the jeep and head back and tell them sorry I don't have it right now when it just literally the heavens opened and it landed in my head it's just wow we all need that that time and that space and that place to call our own and then uh, Sarah says, Tilly Olson has exquisitely explored the creative voice when it is muffled, muzzled, and mute. In quotes, the unnatural thwarting of what struggles to come into being but cannot in her book Silences. Olson, Olson herself was silenced for 20 years while she raised and supported four children through menial jobs that left her no energy to write. She was nearly 50 when she published her acclaimed first novel, Tell Me a Riddle. Wow. And then Sarah uh, continues, many of us today experience creative silence, not the hush of the heart necessary to bring forth the unexpressed from spirit, but the creative silence brought about by circumstances we feel are beyond our control, lack of time and or lack of space or a place to create. You know, I really get that on another level because there was a time there when it was just, we had some, some stuff happen in the family and I, I was working a re- just a lot and also working up at a local ski resort, which I liked actually, that's not even the story. It was just, um, you know, bartending and also even in the morning and sometimes late into the night, sometimes there were 14 hour shifts. And then I would go back and teach and I would have all these creative ideas, so many ideas in my head. And I, and it was just, I get, I get what Tilly felt in a way because you're trying to hang on to them. You're trying to hold them. And then when you get home, even if you liked what you do, um, if you don't have the, the energy or the time of day and you, you can't express, it can be frustrating for me. I'm definitely more of a morning person. So even if I have the time in the evening, which I don't usually that won't work. So I get how it has to all be in sync for sure. And how it can be frustrating when things are not in sync. And I, I can't even imagine that struggle that, uh, Tilly Olson had when she was unable to express her her creative self while um, being a single mom. Because I know for me, even when I get back from a long weekend and it's been, you know, I try to wiggle in doing videos. I'm just, I'm so built up and full of creativity that I, I, I'm just like, I feel like I'm going to almost just like implode that I just can't wait to get to it when I get back, which is happening now. Actually, we had a wonderful weekend with our son's wedding. I already made one YouTube video. It wouldn't YouTube, YouTube video. Sorry. Um, actually inspired by his weddings, which is, it was just the best time ever. And it, it, I'm having trouble getting it to upload. And, and I just, I'm like so frustrated. So, I mean, I kind of get that, not on her level, but I get having that creativity just in you 
And if you're too tired to express it or have any kind of glitches along the way, it can be enormously frustrating. And then uh, Sarah continues, perhaps we also suffer from a lack of clarity, a failure to realize how necessary it is to nurture our sacred creativity daily. Oh my gosh, that is so true. And I, I think I, I mentioned in a recent podcast um, how when I was home with four of our five little blessings, I was just, uh, oh my God, I was on fire, right? The, my first book about young motherhood is called Striving for the Purple Heart. And, you know, Mothers in Search of, I forget the rest of the title, be honest with you, but Striving for the Purple Heart is just like mothers, you know, just trying to get it all done and be everybody's everything and make it all happen, basically. And I, I, and I was just, oh, I was just, it wanted to, it did, it wrote itself, actually. I remember somebody saying to me, don't worry about or don't think about or even strive for trying to think that you're going to, you know, write five chapters in one day, just write a page at a time or a half a page at a time or, and, or record yourself. If you don't have the time to actually write and you're on the fly, you can record yourself while you're driving or doing the dishes. And oh my gosh, was so true. And so I would start just not putting that pressure on myself and it's and and anybody who, who is a creative knows you can't force that stuff. It comes to you in the shower. It comes to you in the car, especially because those are downtime. It comes to you when you're sleeping. You wake up at three thirty in the morning, just ready to go and write. Which thankfully I roll with that because that's very important to roll with that. That's like yeah, that can be your most creative time. Wayne Dyer talks a lot about that. And I also know what it's like to have you know hit speed bumps to get in the way. Just you know life stuff. Does that even be bad? It's just. You got to be at this, you got to be at that. And like, okay, put that on hold kind of thing. And then, um, so Sarah talks about the fact that, you know, many of us say, uh, we don't, well, she says, unless we live alone, don't have a room entirely of our own. I want to be super clear. That's not what what we're talking about here. You know, here we've been in this house since 2001. It's now 2022. None of this space opened up, obviously the fabulous five young adults here. Um, We're not talking about that if you have that space yet. Uh, She says, but that does not mean we cannot carve out a small psychic space, even a nook to call ours alone. And let me tell you, I've had to do this for years. She says, I have a friend who created a personal space in the corner of a city apartment with a floral folding screen from the 1930s that she found at a flea market. I love this. Behind it, she angled a small desk and a chair near a sunny window for a restorative retreat. I love that. And personally... There's there's some certain bo- there are some boxes that need to be checked for me. I need I need to have light. I I have a colleague once who who had a, um and somebody's still in there, but it's, the space at Champlain is used differently now. But it was just a a tight it was just tight space for a while with office office space. And he was new, and he had this office there temporarily, but it was a long temporarily, um with no windows. So he kept the door open and everything. And now he's now he's got a great office. And I'm thinking, oh my God, how does he do this? Because I have a thing with, with window space and I don't have a lot of window space in my current office, but I love it because it's, it's enough. It, it's sunny. It, it, it spaces the lake and the mountains and it, um, so it doesn't have to be big. My office is actually very tiny and I absolutely love it. And we're talking about, um, even if you don't have like a separate room in your house, because most people don't, I don't think. And just to create a corner if, or if you're in a, like Sarah was saying, like in a, you know, a, um, I'm thinking of Manhattan, of course, because that's my sort of uh, reference point, or LA, or you know, Tokyo, or you know, Istanbul, or whatever. You have a little corner you can use, you know, a little um, divider, or even just a desk, a desk, because it's not just about the space; it's about it's about your territory, kind of like do- how dogs pee on a bush. Not to be graphic, but that's kind of what I mean. This is my space, my family picture, my picture of my partner. My positive little affirmations, even if it's a tiny little spot that no one can go and put things on, that you've kind of put it out that there's like a little force field, that that is your spot. And then she writes, no room for a screen or a desk and a chair? Then start with a bookcase, all your own. You know what? We did that with my husband. Just had that thought at this minute. Back when we were first, we were newly married. We, had, we were living in an apartment in Virginia. And our, our oldest son came along pretty quickly after we were married. And so we had a room for just a few months, which then became Ryan's room. 
And my husband is is a is a history nut. He just loves all things history, especially American history, especially the 20th century presidents. But anyway, he just loves history in general and political science. And so his books are precious to him. And he is all wherever we've lived, no matter how small or large, he's had his own bookcases. And now we have a, we have more space. And now he's got some space downstairs for those. But even in our tiny, teeny, tiny apartment. He had his own bookcase for his stuff, and he all and he would put like his, his Star Trek things on top of that or, or whatever. But it's just so important to have a tiny place at least to call your own. For mental health reasons, it's very important. And what else does she say here? She says the important thing is that the bookcase is yours, a psychic space that offers passionate reminders to attend to your private artistic impulses. A place to encourage you to reclaim your your creativity. Oh my gosh, that is so true. And now, I have. I mean, we didn't like you know sit down and have a chat and talk about this. Like that's my bookcase and this is yours. It was just was sort of happened very organically, just very naturally, because I've got a bookcase downstairs too. That's all my psychology, positive, you know, all my stuff, well-being related, you know. Books are all on there, and his are all around the left part of the living room, which fl- his floor-to-ceiling books with his history books. And it's just even as you know, married for like a thousand years here, you still need your your me stuff because this kind of is a reflection of your individuality and, and your passion and what you love. And it, not only is it okay, it's essential, and that's it. So create a nook. And or niche, no matter what that means for you, of your own. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful, beautiful Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day.